We have Benjamin Fletcher, uh, Director of Parking for the City of Portsmouth, uh, who is going to be talking about all of the uh, the cool stuff that Portsmouth is doing. And we have uh, Derek Lassard of uh, Sales from Sparking, Head of Sales, uh, who is going to be uh, hosting this. Uh, if you have any questions, I'm going to be monitoring them. And uh, yeah, thank you all for coming very much. Bye. Perfect. Uh, thanks, Paul. Uh, Ms. Paul alluded to, my name is Derek Lassard. I'm the head of sales here at Smarking. Uh, I joined the firm about six months ago and have been working really closely with customers, partners, prospects um, as we continue to evolve the world of, you know, the digital transformation in the parking ecosystem. So um, happy to have Ben with us, you know, here today as a Northeaster myself. Um, ben, as Paul alluded to, is the director of parking for Portsmouth, New Hampshire. I'll let Ben, you know, I'll let Ben introduce himself, tell you a little bit about the operation that he runs today, and then we'll get into what we, what we consider to be a little fireside chat after we do a, a brief introduction of uh, of Smarking. So thank you, Derek, and thanks everybody for for coming um, and, and the opportunity to speak today. So I'm, uh, as Derek alluded to, the uh, parking director for the city of Portsmouth, New Hampshire, a uh, small seacoast town, twenty three thousand residents, but we do. Uh, somewhere between 40 and 60,000 visitors a week during the, the peak tourist tourism season. So we see an awful lot of uh, inbound and outbound traffic, particularly over the weekends. Been here about five years after stays in a number of states uh, across the country, uh, handling uh, you know, NFL, NBA, uh, uh, MLB programs, um, uh, high-rise projects, hospitals, uh, hotels, things of that nature. So. Uh, really enjoying uh, the the all the different aspects of uh, of parking at, at a municipality, especially one as vibrant and, and lively as uh, the city of Portsmouth. So uh, that's I think that's enough about me on introduction, and and certainly uh, you can uh, continue to lead, Derek. Perfect. So before we get into it, we're just going to do a quick um, you know who who Smarking is for those that don't know. I think the majority of folks here today probably do, um, but for those that don't, we'll just go to, through a brief introduction. So. Um, Smart has been around since 2015, and you know our focus has been around digitizing parking, right? So it is a, it's a, an ecosystem that continues to evolve, continues to gr to grow. Um, we're currently serving over 2,500 parking locations, and that's through a, a across a very diverse profile of of customers. So CRE firms, um, hospitals, municipalities, and cities, obviously, um, as well as dealing directly with parking operators. Um, big thing that we like to, um, to to tout is the fact that we are an integration partner with over 60 plus parking technology providers. So those are your traditional parks, those are pay stations, all the mobile apps. Um, so really anything that you're using to, that you could potentially be using to capture revenue, occupancy, duration, uh, we're able to capture. Um, and then we're a thought leader, you know, in the space, which we think is very, very important. It's not just taking, but it's also giving. So we do a lot of speaking engagements. We are looked at as a subject matter expert for, you know, established entities such as, you know, IPMI, MPA, NEPC, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and, you know, our, our flagship product um, and, and one that Ben is intimately familiar with is uh, the business intelligence solution from Smarking. Um, it is the standard parking management offering. Right. So we're providing real KPI tracking, in-depth and out analytics. So you can go out and actually make decisions around pricing, around rates. Um, but also, you know, for the folks that don't have a lot of resources in terms of human capital, allocation of some staffing needs and understanding consumer, you know, parking behavior. Um, we, we provide a consolidated view of all locations, regardless if it's a garage, a surface lot, um, you know, on street parks. Um, and really what we're going to talk about today and highlight is providing insight to drive policy change. Um, but not only giving you that insight to drive that change, but the ability to monitor that once those trends are actually um, implemented. So, excuse me, monitor those trends once those changes are implemented, right? People always say, all right, we did this, but now what? I, we provide that insight. Um, and Ben can speak, like I said, intimately about his, his experience using this marketing platform and how it helped not only the, the city, but the constituents within that city, um, which ultimately drives resident satisfaction. So a little bit about Portsmouth outside of what Ben has just shared, you know, uh, a coastal city. So um, vibrant community for tourism and visitors, um, population of, um, as he alluded to, about, about 20, 23,000 people. 
Um, you know, and, and really the thing that Ben was looking at and the city was looking at was, you know, they were challenged, you know, with increased turnover and availability to space. So, you know, the, the crux of, of how Smarking and the city of Portsmouth worked together, Ben, was really around the, the stay and pay program that you guys implemented, right? And, you know, the, the primary objective of that was to, to continue to encourage, you know, a turn for parkers at three hours, but also allowing residents and visitors who choose to, to stay longer an opportunity to continue a parking session. <clears throat> So that, that was the crux of that program. And, you know, how did that come about, you know, as, as you started to kind of look at this program, independent of smarking, independent of technology, you know, what, what were the things really driving th this program? So uh, I'll back up just a little bit. Uh, one of the great things about having experience in different venues, particularly hospitals, is that uh, data-driven Decision making is is very important as uh, as you speak to folks such as doctors or, or, or administrators that <clears throat> may not necessarily understand some of the nuances. But uh, hard data and real time data is important in, in helping uh, move the boulder down the road, so to speak. When there's a bureaucracy, and it's very similar in a uh, in a city or municipal setting, no matter how large or small, uh, you've got to convince people, and the best way to do that is to show them, you know, these are the results we're getting, and this is what the data is telling us, and uh, if we if we make a change in, in this regard, then we'll get the result we're looking for. And if we don't, then simply we won't. So the policymakers can have uh, some cut and dried cho uh, choices to make. So in 2011, uh, the, the city uh, commissioned a, a parking study from an outside resource that uh, ended up uh, in, a, in a list of uh, the 2012 uh, parking principles. Uh, one of which was the decision to uh, to shoot for a three hour turn, given that uh, the city at the time had more restaurant seats than it has residents. So a lot of our usership uh, was coming at the at the uh, at the noon hour and the, and the and the dinner hour as well. You'd see peaks and valleys between the two, and uh, the three hour stay was what was deemed uh, acceptable or, or reasonable for uh, what a, a target on turns. So. There's a couple of ways you can do that. The city at the time decided that um, a punitive measure where you had three, if you stayed longer than three hours, you'd get a parking citation, or you'd have to move your car 500 feet and to adjudicate all of the nonsense of driving one space over or just move it, move, uh, driving enough just to move the chalk mark, which we were still using at the time. Um, <clears throat> so when I came in, I, I noticed that, and we heard a lot of uh, uh, public feedback that, that people would like to stay a little bit longer if they could. So. We decided to develop and use data to develop and um, and display what we thought would be a better alternative, and that was opposed to as opposed to a punitive measure where you write a citation after the third hour, uh, we would provide an option to stay, but the uh, the pricing would increase from hour four and beyond. So, uh, the way we set it up was uh, we're still only two dollars an hour uh, each of the first three hours, uh, which was a maximum ticket at the time of six dollars and. Only now you're able to stay a uh, fourth hour and beyond. It just it converts to five dollars per hour. So uh, some of the interesting things that that happened when we we were able to get this passed uh, right at the onset, uh, pretty much of the COVID situation. It was uh, in August of 2020. Uh, a lot of cities were looking at a massive, massive drop in revenues. You know, up to 80 to 90 percent in a lot of cases, and we got this passed through. Um, and what we noticed was that uh, over the course of the next year, I've been researching uh, that about 91 or uh, percent of folks still decided to turn at that third hour. So we had our success rate of 91 percent turning at the third hour, which was uh, the city's goal. Uh, so, but what what really happened there was uh, where did that the traffic went? It, it 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 migrated into the two garages. So we saw at the time uh, of the of the of the uh, printed publication that Smarking did. In, uh, in June of 21 was a 42% increase uh, in one in transaction uh, revenue per transaction uh, at one garage and a 26% increase in revenue tr per transaction at the other garage, which came from a, a increased length of stay of 4.8 to 7.1 hours in one garage and 3.6 to 3.9 in the other, which was closer into town. Uh, that resulted in a 14% year over year increase in revenue uh, per transaction across the system. And the interesting thing about that is it's closer to 32% now and you go back and compare to the numbers we had in 2019 as we start to see those volume figures return. 
So it really helped uh, the city, of course, with um, in its in its active recovery from the, the prior year and the shutdown. Uh, we were at about seventy percent year over year revenues, where I know a lot of uh, other cities were suffering at ten to twenty percent due to lack of volume, and some of that, of course has to do with the popularity of the city of Portsmouth and how beautiful it is and how, how, how big of an attraction on the eastern uh, seacoast it is for, for visitors all, from Boston all the way to Portland and, and, uh, and also Vermont and, and several other nearby states. Uh, so some of that was from that, of course, we're lucky there. And, but a big part of that was, was making this change to um, and, and, and using the data to show <clears throat> the value of the change after the fact, which I still continue to do. So uh, that 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 was basically we called it the stay and pay program. So you can you can stay as long as you want. It just pays a little bit more, and then but the garages don't have that same escalator, so that they're a flat rate per hour. Uh, so that makes that a more attractive option for those willing to walk a little bit further. Sure. Peeling back a couple of things that you'd mentioned, um, you know, we started, you know, Smarking started working with with the city in, in 2017, right? Mm -hmm. So aggregating this data in a visualized fashion, um, you know, how did you come up with, how did you use that data to really come up with those flex rates, right? How did you know that those were the right rates, right? It's, it's clear that the timing, the time, the three hour limit, you, you, you know, you had a good idea of that, but how did you use the data to come up with the rates? Hey, this is what we should do. This is what we're proposing. Um, to sell that to you know your constituents and to the, the city. The so concept. there's a there's a couple of factors there. Uh, a lot of it has to do with politics. Um, we're two dollars an hour in, in our high occupancy zone, and we're just a dollar fifty an hour uh, for the first three hours in our in our non high occupancy zone. Uh, those are about the same prices as Lincoln, Nebraska, but Lincoln's not get, getting sixty thousand visitors a week except for five days of the year when the football team's in town, and, and it's not twenty dollars or two dollars that day. It's 50. So, you know, part of the issue is, you know, the pricing structure that exists and existed at the time is, is, is not adequate when you consider overall occupancy and demand rates in the 150 to 180 percent in most of our zones when Donald Shoup tells us all we're supposed to be shooting for 85 percent. So, uh, but that was a discussion I put at the end of my five-year plan as opposed to the beginning of it like I would at a normal uh, commercial environment uh, because of the politics involved with it. So the first thing we did was we used smarting occupancy data to expand the high occupancy zone. And then we deployed, we went from a, a pay and display system to a pay by plate system with the help of our partners at Flowbird Calais. Uh, now you enter your license plate number and the plate owns the session. So there are a number of advantages there, but not the least of which is if somebody tries to buy the first and second and third hour again, the machines know that that person has had an active session in the same zone recently and will charge them the elevated rate. So those are some pieces of the puzzle that needed to be in, uh, put in place. Uh, the par our partners at Park Mobile uh, ha have helped us with that as well and uh, have allowed us to do a second tier of pricing for residents that prove their residency uh, through, a, through a plate whitelist. So we're, we're now in a position where we can have an honest discussion about uh, whether or not rates should be adjusted to, to bring our occupancies more along the line of, of what we're looking for. So there, there's a lot of factors to the, that. There's a long answer to that short question, and that's, you know, some of it's political. Uh, I, I had to stick with the $2. Uh, I figured there's, there's no way we we're going to get anything done with those first three hours. So we came up with $5 an hour after that. Uh, I think I shot a little longer than that and let them push back on me a little bit, came down to $5. And then uh, I decided at that point that was going to be a win. We're going to see at that point uh, utilizing the data that we received from you guys, uh, smarting, I should say, to uh, to try and see over the course of the next year, you know, what percentage of folks were still choosing to turn, whether or not that five dollar change, a three dollar change per hour in the A zone, was enough of a deterrent. And uh, you know, there's there's still two parts to that equation. Interestingly, again, we're turning at ninety one percent, so we're having the appropriate effect on the behavior once the person is parked, but we're still sitting on triple digit demand, in some cases, you know, uh, you know, 200% in some afternoons where obviously if somebody pulls out of a three hour session in an hour and a half, and we have somebody else coming in so quickly and taking up that space that the, the, the devices are seeing two vehicles in the same space at the same time, which 
when I described that to the council the first time, somebody said, well, you can't have more than 100%. And I said, well, actually, it's more like the heat index. You know, so we know it's 100 degrees out, but it feels like 107 degrees and, or 110 or whatever it may be. And the, how that translates to the parking experience, if you're driving down the road and you, you see the store you want to go to and, and 10 cars down, if a car pulls out, well, you've got a you know, couple hundred feet to walk, no big deal. Uh, in 100% occupancy, you go down and get that space a little further away. It's less convenient, but it's available. In 130% occupancy, there's five cars in front of you waiting to take the space. So uh, the fact that the uh, system allowed us to, to push more traffic into the garages uh, has a positive effects of lowering the carbon footprint. The city's walkability rating is higher now. The congestion is lower. And uh, anybody with a girlfriend knows that if you're walking by, you know, a, a storefront that's got a pretty bag inside, you're going in. But if you're driving around looking for, you know, a parking space and, and pounding on your steering wheel frustrated, uh, you're not, and you're not supporting those businesses or uh, the old coffee shop axiom. If all the employees are parked in the spaces, you're going to go down the road to the next coffee shop. So the idea of being, you know, behind all of this holistic approach is, is to get those spaces turned to support the local businesses. And uh, it's very fortunate that we don't have a sales tax here. So I can't give you sales tax year over year changes. I'm glad to not have that data, but uh, I would suspect that businesses would report, give, you know, sans the COVID situation, that they have seen increased usage and increased foot traffic. I know that we have. Sure. We've, we've talked about, COVID. well, COVID's come up. I mean, it's hard to avoid it, um, but it's come up three times now, just in this, you know, in the first 20 minutes of this dialogue. Oh, so one of the things that you guys did that, you know, I think there's probably a fear of, and even, even now, right, we're not back to quote unquote, pre-pandemic levels, but there's a fear of raising rates, right? So um, you guys happen to do that, um, you know, in, in August of 2020, right? So that was just as things were really, really ramping up, right, mm -hmm. with, with COVID. And, you know, we had Omicron and Delta, so variants. But, you know, how did that sit with, you know, your constituents? How did that sit with businesses? Um, and were you using data? Um, to, to kind of sell why we're doing this? Um, you know, can, you, can you shed some color on that? So a couple of factors. The first three hours remained unchanged. So it, it, the, the price of somebody staying the first three hours, uh, that's an easy sell. It's people that were choosing to alter the behavior and stay longer that were going to be charged more. Uh, and that would be their decision to do so. So um, the, the, and that, that, that's, that's what made that an easy sell. You know, the difficult sell is going to be, are these rates appropriate going forward? And that discussion is going to need to be had as the cost of energy uh, skyrockets. And uh, in, in our situation, the, the, uh, the parking division uh, puts 2.4 million into the general fund every year, plus another 2 million in services we support, uh, such as snow removal, uh, police cars, fire trucks, school crossing guards, things like that. All of these services uh, have to be paid for in one way or the other. And the only other source of revenue the city would have would be uh, property taxes from the state of New Hampshire. So if you look at it holistically, the parking division puts uh, about, uh, reduces the average uh, household uh, bur tax burden by about $350 a year. And so that's, a, that's an easy sell when you're trying to, to talk about where the money actually goes once it's collected. So when, that dis when, when, when the decisions are made to have these discussions and we're, and we're required to go ahead and continue supporting these services, looking at the higher electrical and, and, and gasoline and other costs, you know, as we, as we go through what we're going through nationally, uh, the discussion is going to have to be had. And, and that, that is the, the market is going to force that discussion. So I basically reversed, you know, instead of talking pricing, when I first walked in the door, I put it last on the list and we, we decided to shore up all the stuff behind the scenes and utilizing, uh, in each of these cases, I was able to utilize data that I would receive from, from your group to go into the council and say, this is the concept, this is why we should do this, this is what's gonna happen uh, when, these, when, when these changes take place. And you know, again, using live real-time data, it, it's hard to say no when, you, when you're looking for a specific result and it's a stated result. Um, it, it's not me standing up there being emotional and talking about how I feel this or I, I believe that, uh, you know, I, that, that really doesn't matter. What matters is, you know, uh, hard numbers. And so that, that's what the, the, the real positive advantage to having this live data. 
and and working with your your teams early on you know we have street by street side, side each side of each street is is categorized very carefully with meter populations that can be you know uh, designated uh, looked at over time uh, bundled uh, and and certain virtual locations are bundled certain streets are bundled together at, at our request and you guys were uh, able to to put us in position to see you know just the a zone or just the lots or just the b zone and that type of thing so it's very helpful when somebody has questions i always seem to have that answer you know and it, it, i have it at the ready so it makes me look a heck of a lot smarter when it comes time to talking about uh you know what's going to happen with this or what are our percentages there i can usually rattle off most of them off the top of my head because i look at them all day sure so you know you and i leading up to this this webinar here we we talked about you know data 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 you know and i think the phrase i uh, was thrown around was hey we know you know a lot of your peers are, are data rich but information poor right so um you know with the with the adoption of additional technologies where it's not just your your parks or it's not just your pay stations it's not just your meters right it's there's millions and millions of data points um, that you're looking at on a you know weekly, monthly basis. And you know, we we talk to a lot of different folks. And some folks have, you know, like yourself, 30 years of experience. Some folks just have a few years of few years of experience and they start looking at this data. So it's a mix of experience, you know, when we talk to talk to a lot of folks. Um, you know, what have you learned over time of how you've looked at data and as that is that transitioned coming out of COVID? Is that transition making these types of changes? Um, and, and what advice do you have for folks that, you know, maybe are going through transitions like this? This is the, These are the key points that you need to look at. So the real power of, of this marketing product <clears throat> lies in the fact that the data is conglomerated when anybody that has, you know, multi, different types of meters, I've got Cali meters, uh, I've got the, or excuse me, uh, Flowbird, I've got Cal, uh, I'm just gonna keep calling them Cali. Got Cali meters, I've got IPS meters, I've got the different garages, I've got the Puck Mobile app. Each one of those systems has their own back of the house uh, that you can pull data from, download it into a comma, delimited, whatever, 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 spreadsheet looking thing, and then yeah, CSV file, yeah, yeah, and, and smear it around and, and and try to make something useful out of it. The the, the thing about the the smarking product is a lot of that gets done for you just on the fly, which is very very helpful. Uh, it's it's hard enough to learn one of those back of the house systems, but each of them operates slightly differently. So you know, with this product, you're able to go and um, and 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 look at it, you know, more from a from just a, somebody painted me a picture standpoint, you know, and say, look, this is what's happening, and not have to go gather the data from IPS and do the length of stay analysis and do the percentage analysis and do the demand versus last year and, and all the other files you'd have to have. Uh, that stuff is just automated, so it's it's very handy to have. I mean, I. I can perform those data analyses because I've got the experience, but a lot of folks that come in uh, to the parking world are not from the parking world. Uh, they, they come from other industries, you know, for whatever reason. And, and a lot of them come with the, uh, with the misconception that it's just, you know, concrete and lines and it's going to be easy, but there's a lot of uh, nuances to, uh, to parking, especially when you've got, you know, a limited inventory like we do. Uh, and again, dropping 9% uh, of that highest grossing revenue for, for restaurant space to repurpose it for the summer. So we're an even tighter than we were. So we have high demand and, and limited inventory and being able to understand how it's being used and then use the data to, to make changes that direct and direct the decision-making uh, of the constituency. So a lot of folks will, will they, they just assume that we're, we're, you know, everything's about collection of money and, and from, we're not bonus. So it doesn't matter to me how much we collect. What matters to me is, is that the policies that we put in place have the appropriate behavior management axioms associated with them and that what we're looking to do actually happens. So, you know, going back to the earlier conversation of getting longer stays in the garage, that means more people are walking. That means they're going by storefronts. All of those things are positives uh, that have come from, being able to show data to lay people, such as councilmen or, or, or citizens, explain to them <clears throat> how some of these things work without going you know, way over their head because you can just show them the data. And, uh, and, and, and again, for somebody who's not as experienced, uh, you know, having the, the information at your fingertips in, in, in on one page or one dashboard, so to speak, <clears throat> can be very, very helpful because it's, it's daunting to look at each of these different back of the house systems and some of them are pretty antiquated sure 
I won't yeah. mention name by name, which is which are the best, but, but Park Mullins was pretty good. Yeah. <clears throat> Excuse me. So you, you've talked about tourism. Um, we have a lot of experience working with, with clients that have a, a high tourism population or a high tourism activity. Um, you know, Aspen, City of Miami, Santa Monica, mm -hmm. um, and obviously here in, um, you know, Portsmouth, you know, on the coastline, you know, weaving coastline, beachfront, you know, waterfront, excuse me. So what are, what are some of the unique challenges that you potentially deal with? I mean, one of the things you said to me, we're a, a small city with big city problems, right? So what are some of those unique problems and, and how do you deal with the, I guess, the seasonality? right, of, of parking. And, you know, I know traffic flow is handled, you know, uh, outside of your, your purview, but how do you deal with that seasonality and some of the unique challenges that having a, a coastal city, you know, presents? So uh, believe it or not, we're, we're not seeing as much seasonality even as we were a few years ago. <clears throat> Excuse me. <clears throat> Sorry. Uh, really this, this past year, only January and February, uh, were months that were a little bit lower. Uh, everything else was, was almost consistent with the, obviously the highest months being uh, August, uh, July and August. And, and that pattern has, has uh, continued this year. In fact, September is this year is for the, for the first 11 days was, was a higher collection and higher demand than July was um, behind August. But September being higher in July was a little bit of a surprise. So I think we're going to see some latent vacationers coming up this year there's families that may not be able to afford the expensive vacation so they're going to come to Portsmouth two or three times as opposed to once uh, we've got the fall season coming in and people like to come up here and go up to the White Mountains and look at the, the leaves change uh, so there's and, and there's there's deep sea fishing there's there's uh, there's boats there's all kinds of attractions some of the challenges include this is a 400 year old city so <clears throat> We have narrow streets. Uh, we have uh, limited availability when it comes to mass transit. Uh, we're, we are uniquely visited by you know everybody from Boston to Portland, and it's hard to imagine a family of four taking the bus from New York up to the C and J uh, or uh, on the C and J. It's a great product, but you know once that family of four got here, they'd still have to take an Uber into the city, and then they wouldn't ha be, have their vehicle to get around. So. We're uniquely challenged with single family or single single user vehicles uh, here in Portsmouth because there's not a, a whole lot, there's not a robust, and they're, they're really, because of the infrastructure, can't be a really robust uh, uh, mass transit situation. So we, we kind of have to try and, 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 and relegate, you know, in other ways or, or regulate in other ways. And that's, that, and that's through some of these concepts that we use here and, and trying to get people into the garages and more walking and try to inform people, particularly with events. We had uh, 7,500 people show up for a concert on Thursday night last week. Uh, ahead of time, we had put, put out the messaging that, you know, if you park in this location, then, you know, we can put a different rate there. And to attract traffic over there, we had an event called Tall Ships a few weeks ago where they brought in the big um, fully masted uh, sailing ships uh, for, for people to look at. And there's all kinds of events there. We set up a shuttle system with three different uh, points around the outside outskirts of town and relayed that information through all the different portals that, that we found uh, to get the uh, event goers understanding, you know, where to go before they came to the city so that they would not go through the city looking for parking. They would go straight to their destination and uh, we were prepared at that point to accept the extra traffic flow. Uh, the shuttle system worked magnificently. We have shuttle partners that come up uh, from Massachusetts that are fantastic that help us every year. So it's a lot of it's trying to manage expectations and behavior before somebody even arrives. Sure. No, that makes a lot of sense. You know, and, and you know, you, you talk about the residents and the constituents. How do you how do you garner feedback? From those those folks about changes that you're making or or trends in the space, and whether that's people yelling at you, whether it's people applauding you, um, I'm sure it's it's more of the latter, the <clears> former <throat> than the latter. <laughs> yeah, but, yeah, but how are you how are you garnering that feedback? Well, we we have a very vocal constituency, uh, for better or for worse. I actually enjoy talking to people because I'm very data driven, and usually when the conversation is over, they thank me for understanding a little bit better. The complexities that go into the decisions to get made and, and uh, they may not get the answer they wanted but they at least understand why so 
Um, we have, uh, you know, different avenues for citizenry to speak uh, to the city. Uh, one of them is called Parking, Traffic and Safety. It's a committee that includes uh, one city councilor. It includes the city manager, um, the director of DPW, myself, uh, my transportation engineer, and five um, constituents from um, the, uh, the, the, the populace. So, and then and, and that those meetings occur on, you know, every first Thursday, you know, and people can come in and they can zoom in at this point now. Uh, they can come in and, 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 and basically pitch what they think, you know, they'd like to see happen on their streets or, you know, if we've got a, if we have a staff initiative such as stay and pay, uh, uh, we would, we would introduce that in that, in that venue. So it's on record. Uh, people can go look at it. They can, they can read about it. They can see the minutes of the meeting. And then, you know, typically what happens is we, we will do studies uh, based on, you know, what I think will happen or, or the, uh, traffic engineers will get involved and help me understand what what certain streets activity really is as opposed to the perception from pe that people might have and then that group would get a, a rep with that includes a counselor would give a recommendation to the council uh, and if that when it gets on the docket there then you know typically I, I would go down or, or zoom in and, and give a presentation to help uh, the remaining uh, council members understand what we're looking to do and why and you know, it's it, it, those those presentations are almost nothing but data. So if you're if you're not excited about data, they're not uh, they're probably not very exciting presentations. But if you have an insomnia problem, I I got you. Sure, sure. So uh, obviously, with um with Smarking with our with our firm, we're a uh, we're a SaaS company, right? Software as a service. So we mm -hmm. we provide you know technology <clears throat> first and foremost. Um, we do look at ourselves as a a software plus you know organization, just mm -hmm. meaning that. We're working really closely with our clients that are capturing data through their systems. You know, that data might be in that dashboard and they can't, you know, they don't always have the insight or the, the foresight, excuse me, to, to make changes or to grasp what that data means and what actions to take next. So as you guys start to, you know, form a path forward and look into the future, what are some other, you know, maybe strategic initiatives that, you know, you're looking for data, right, to drive, right? Whether it be, whether it be rates, whether it be even, you know, maybe cha changing time constraints again. Is there anything in particular that you're thinking about a year, two years down the road, and and how data is going to help drive a strategic decision that you make for the uh, for the city? Yeah, there are a number of streets that are well over high occupancy that are not in the high occupancy zone. So it, it, any discussion on pricing should occur after that zone is adjusted, so that all streets that that should be affected are affected. Uh, there, there are a number of budding conversations. Uh, we're finally at the point where it's time to have the discussion as to whether or not the pricing is adequate uh, for, for the behavior we're seeing, which is triple digit occupancy in almost every zone, even the, even the low ox zones. And uh, also, we're also in the middle of a construction project where we've lost 30% of our thousand space, uh, 900 space downtown garage. So we're seeing a, a big spike in traffic at the other garage. We're seeing pressure on other areas in the system. And, and seeing what we can do to, to help monitor that and, and go back and give advice there. Again, there are a number of streets that probably ought to be you know, converted to high oc. That'll be one of the things we discuss. Um, uh, pricing certainly will be another thing that we discuss. We have a, an employee program at one of the garages. It's very popular. We should be looking at you know, how we're gonna sustain that when the garages begin to fill as, as traffic becomes even tighter. And, and, and what we're going to do going forward in terms of, you know, are we looking at, at, at different facilities? Are we looking at uh, behavior management? I know when, when we were in San Francisco, the city decided to, to put in about half the parking on a new project that it needed, but really the, all that resulted in was nobody could afford the parking that was available. So it created all kinds of issues there. Uh, so trying to reverse engineer uh, the social uh, mobility of somebody to, and say, well, they'll, ju they'll just have bicycles if there's no parking. It doesn't, uh, it doesn't seem to ring realistic. So we need to consider, you know, that it, we're not going to see much reduction in, in, in vehicles, even if we get, even if they're all electric, if they're all, uh, you know, I don't know, powered by wind. I mean, it's, you're still going to see single person vehicles in, in this particular environment because of the way it's built. And there's little we can do to change that. So uh, we're going to be having discussions on pricing. We're going to have, uh, be having discussions on, on you know, what lots are, you know, priced under what paradigm uh, and, and being able to utilize the data. Will, it, it makes it pretty easy for me to say, well, you know, if, if our stated goal is 85 percent, 
Porter Streets at 162 that there that suggests that something ought to be done. And you know, the interesting sociological thing is that you know, and I'll use the Northeast example. Everybody up here understands that it costs more to see Tom Brady throw a touchdown pass from the from the 50 yard line than it does from the cheap seats than it does from home because there's more value in being closer to what you want to, what you want to be near but it doesn't seem to translate to parking for folks you know they just think that parking should be free or or you know my my staff is out there just digging through your ashtrays looking for quarters when in reality you know we'd rather be showing you where the great restaurants are and not writing you citations so my staff's first instruction is to try to help people use the meters understand how they work introduce them to park mobile or text to park uh, so that we can be, have, have them be a little bit more on an ambassador uh, type situation than, than uh, an adversarial writing a ticket situation. So uh, it's, it's going to be an interesting set of conversations going forward, but we have locked all the other pieces. Using you guys, we've locked all the other pieces in place, uh, such as the stay and pay program, such as the uh, pay by plate. Which is which is a great move for for just about anybody that has the uh, the resources to do it, and uh, and 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 our partners at at, at Calais and, and and certainly at Part Mobile and you guys have all been very flexible and, and easy to use, or, and easy to work with, I should say, uh, in, in in getting what you know the results we'd like to see, because uh, once you've once you've told the public one thing, if it doesn't happen just so well. You hear about it quite a bit, which gets back to your initial question: How do people converse with you? And and that's how they do that. And and there's also C click fix where they can say, you know, the sight line on this road is this or that, which I can forward over to my engineers. Um, some people might want a speed bump on there, or a, a you know, a, 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 your speed is sign or flashing crosswalk or what have you. And there are there are certain metrics that that you that you put in play when. When, uh, <clears throat> when deciding whether or not to add a, a you know a sixteen thousand dollar flashing crosswalk, it's you know the number of crossings and things like that. So that's all part of the holistic program as to how the traffic moves through the city, and you know we're the first and last impression everybody gets of their experience in Portsmouth. So uh, we want them to be able to get in smoothly, park their vehicles, go have fun, not get a ticket on the way out because that leaves a bad taste in their mouth, and then and then tell their friends that they had a nice time and. And a big part of that can be interacting with with my staff uh, that we try to train down to uh, down to the person that uh, they 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 understand that we're here as ambassadors and and that uh, you know somebody coming in the door angry and 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 hostile it's it's not directed at them but you know just to calm them down and, and explain to them how things are working and why and it's all part of the holistic picture of trying to uh, to manage the behavior manage the expectation. And then, uh, and then use the data that's available to us to make suggestions to council. Sure. Yeah, we you see news stories, you know, almost daily of, you know, public, you know, entities, municipalities, cities, you know, making these changes, rolling these changes out, and then dealing with uh, with an uproar within the public because they're not using data. Right. There, there is no logic behind the changes that were made. Um, you know, it, people think it's literally people in a room throwing a, a dart at a dartboard to say, all right, here's 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 what our rate should be. Here's the new rate. Um, you know, obviously having that data to support that makes a lot of sense. One other thing that you mentioned, too, with was just construction, which, you know, for any major city or, you know, even even in the suburbs, you see a lot of construction still happening, which obviously eliminates potential real estate for parking. Right. So. Um, you know, with that being said, um, are there are there limitations that you guys will have in terms of changes that you can make based on some of the some of the construction? It sounds like it's minor, um, but if that continues to uh, to evolve in the city, um, is that a concern of yours moving forward, or do you think you guys have that under under control? Well, I mean, it's always a concern. We've got 21 projects that I'm aware of in the works right now, and some of them are major. Um, there's some areas of town of downtown that are that are ripe for redevelopment. And so uh, fortunately, my traffic engineer has a seat at the table when it comes to development. I have an excellent relationship with uh, with our development staff. And so we, we do collaborate on on what uh, my uh, position is on, you know, the impact of certain things. You know, if you're putting in 21 uh, single housing units, you know, you know, how many vehicles can you expect? What's realistic? Where are you going to put them? 
Um, and so or when a large uh, situation goes in, you know, like a convention center, which one, I know the ones uh, being spoken about now, you know, how much parking do they include that's, you know, relative to just that project? And is any of that inventory going to be uh, open to uh, the city uh, uh, users and, and residents and visitors? So, you know, we try to just collaborate openly and, and we have the ability uh, with the data to to help the the planners and the engineers understand what the impacts might be anybody that's been in this industry as long as i have realizes and knows that uh, at least in the past parking was always the last concern of whatever building went in or whatever you know stadium got put in or whatever and then they would they would come to the parking teams afterward and say can you fix this mess and so the the idea for us is to try and be have a seat at the table at the beginning of the discussion so that all all things are considered including parking because that is always the first and last impression if you can't get to where you're going it doesn't matter how cool it is and um or how much fun it was or, or whatever uh you when when i ran the atlanta braves for a couple of seasons um uh, we, we, we could get people to the edge of the lot almost instantly, but it was up to the PD to get them out of there after that because that footprint was ill-designed for 54,000 folks to come charging in while the city was dumping its, its daily CBD out, you know, outbound, you know, at, at 530, you know, 83 times a year or 40, whatever times a year, I think it's 83. Yep. So and it, it was not designed for that. It was designed for the 96 Olympics. And so, you know, we had a hundred cops on the payroll trying to move cars. And, but the biggest complaint was I couldn't get out of the lot and, and it ruined my whole experience and, you know, yada, 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 give me a free Jersey. So, um, the, the, the perception is, is nine tenths of the rule. And, and it often doesn't matter because Facebook exists. There's an unofficial Facebook page that I don't typically read, but they let me know what's on it. Uh, because people tend to speak freely when they're behind their keyboard and, and you know, uh, uh, to get back to what you were talking about earlier, a lot of governance these days is done on emotion. And I, I do none of that. We, we do everything based on logic and data. And sometimes that infuriates folks that want, you know, to feel a certain way about a certain project or, or, or hope for something like this or that. But if you, if, you, if you want the result that you believe you want, then you have to take a pragmatic approach. And that includes data analysis uh, of all types. And parking is certainly one of those. You know, the engineers might know how to build the building, but if they don't have a good ingress and egress process, then the site's not going to be successful and the ownership group's not going to be happy. And, and the people that live there, work there, play there, what, what have you, are not going to be happy with that product either. Sure. No, it makes sense. I mean, some of the other things that we we focus on with our customers, you know, is obviously uh, enforcement and then traffic is traffic patterns as well. And, you know, using data to, to look at heat maps, right, of occupancy, you know, whether it be on street, right, so to understand where those traffic patterns are, you know, with with um, with enforcement, it's really more so about resource allocation, right? You know, do you want to you want to send then those enforcement officials to the the right spot at the right time, right? A shift of, you know, we're up here in the Northeast, you know, a little snowstorm with a two hour delay just changes everything, right? So all of a sudden those 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 timing patterns are off. Um, so are you using any parking data to work with the the traffic team? I know it's not again not under your purview. To provide them with any data so they can make decisions on traffic patterns and any adjustments that need to be made oh we're we're, we're highly integrated the traffic engineers are are one of my uh, budget units that, uh, that that i'm responsible for so we're we're heavily integrated into that so we had a, a, a i think a council suggestion uh, that we make a street that's been one way for some time and two way and so you know i'm working with that engineering team to to, to Take the model we've had developed a few years ago that shows traffic patterns when changes are made. Uh, plug the appropriate data in uh, and, and let them know, you know, what the what I think the effects of of a two way would be as opposed to a one way, uh, like it is now. So I mean, and you know, with the, that particular street goes directly over a bridge into into the state of Maine in the city of Kittery. So it'll be an interesting uh, study, and so. We have we are integrated into that process, and and absolutely, I you know people ask me, well, what's the utilization on this road? Uh, you know, what, on certain times of the of the year, and 
and, and I'll be able to pull that data, you know, and, and say, hey, if the, you know, if you're talking about September, it looks like this. If you're talking about January, it looks like this. If you're talking about July, it looks like this. So sure. So heat heat mapping occupancy at different every di different days, different months, times, sure. whatever the case may be. Okay, great, great. Um, I think is there anything else you want to add then? Any any uh, any other points that you want to uh, highlight here? Because I know we're coming up. Um, you know, we have 15 minutes, but I know there might be some Q and A, and obviously we want to wrap. Well, no, I'm actually fine. Everybody knows I'm too long-winded anyway. So if there's any questions, I'll be happy to try to direct my attention to getting answers for folks. Or if they want to contact us over here, uh, you, you feel free. I'm, I'm, I'm easy to find. Sure. Paul, you want to jump back in? Are there any questions that you know either I or, or Ben can answer here for the audience? You're on mute, my friend. Okay, I'm back. Um... see i think you basically answered a big a bunch of them um talked about seasonality you talked about what makes it unique um yeah i think basically all the the questions that i had were answered perfect uh that i put in before yeah perfect so, so the only thing I'll, I'll highlight here um this is part of a a, a webinar wait. series I want to thank thank ben obviously for uh for joining us today provided a we lot do have of one uh, how do you think about buying new parks equipment, P-A-R-C-S, uh, that is from an anonymous attendee? So um, the interesting thing about parks is over the course of years, there, there are companies that will take the lead in, in, in industry standard, and they, it, it tends to be cyclical, it seems. You know, years and years ago, federal APD was the only way to go, and then Amano, uh, you know, uh, Terry McGann software was bought by Amano, and and that product was 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 top notch for the longest time. Uh, certainly now uh, we've got one garage with with one type of equipment that is under that reconstruction project, and the end of that project is going to be at the addition of a new park system. Uh, it, the The fact that the other garage runs really really well on the equipment that we've got uh, weighs in certainly for me because I know that there will be some functionalities between the two garages with with technology. And uh, they're, they're, I, I just had a rep out here last week. He's a close friend of mine. Uh, was was telling me what's new in, in in his side of the world. You know that his his equipment is down at that at my second garage, and what the what kind of power we'll be able to have in terms of, of moving people, informing people, uh, and, and 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 dealing with things like you know events or uh, snow events where you know we we basically have to clear the roads of of all uh, citizen vehicles because uh, our roads are too narrow to get the plows through if people are parked and we don't have small snowstorms up here, Eric. Uh, I've noticed we, we have large snowstorms up here. So we move people into the garages by mandate and we have to communicate that in about a half dozen ways, including a, we still have a snow phone where people can call in and listen to it. And that, <laughs> that's my voice. But uh, we have a flat rate for those for residents and, and flat rates different in each garage. And how do you adjudicate that mask exit? Uh, it's much, much easier at one facility than it is at the other. Uh, we'll be able to program a lot of different things on the fly. I, I understand that there's a lot of new technologies that, are, that we're going to be able to have at our fingertips uh, going forward a few years from now when it comes time to look at uh, the different parks opportunities. And that doesn't mean that that uh, what we've got at the one garage is going to absolutely be what we put in the other, but certainly uh, the ability of the technology to act together and, and, and deliver a unified product would be would be high on my list to uh, to 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 work towards you know figuring out what we want to put in, and then it's you know do you go with QR codes? Do you go with scanners? You know how much of phone technology do you put in? What are your if it relies on um, uh, you know, Wi-Fi, do you have that availability? Or if your garage is going into the ground, Wi-Fi is tough. So, I mean, there's a lot of factors at play there. Each each garage and each situation is certainly individual. Nice. Sounds good. Uh, do we have any more questions from the uh, from the audience? Please just type them into the Q&A or into the chat. Uh, I can look at them. No, let me see the one. Okay. In that case. I think we are we are good. Derek. 
Great. So as I was alluding to, this is obviously part of a, a webinar series, um, and we we make an attempt here at Smarking to to bring folks like Ben in, who have experience um, not only with our technology, but yeah, you know, with some of the initiatives that you might be either up, you know struggling with, or maybe that you you see upcoming, um, to provide his his insight, his views, and his experience. Um, super valuable, Ben. So appreciate you uh, you uh, joining us today. Um, one thing to note, we will be doing uh, another webinar uh, next month on October 13th. Um, that'll be more product focused. So look for that invite. If there's any questions whatsoever, um, feel free to reach out to any of us. Um, you know, you, you can go directly to our website, contact us. If you need to get in touch with Ben, let us know. Um, but we appreciate everybody for joining us. We'll give you eight minutes back out of your day. Um, and again, thanks again for, uh, for jumping on, Ben. Appreciate it. Appreciate everybody uh, coming on and having me. Thanks for the opportunity. Awesome. Awesome. Talk to you all soon. Bye now. Bye, guys.